Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Dirt Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Eaton, joined once again in the studio here with Andrew Hayes, my co-host. Howdy. We're also joined by Dayton Dragon starting pitcher and today's guest, James Proctor. James, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. No problem. It's great to be here. All right. Well, hey, so you've got an interesting story on, on several accounts here, right? So a Princeton grad already, so you're already the most intelligent person on the panel here, easily by far. <laughs> yeah. Maybe like combined, yeah. you take Andrew and I both. So we'll get to that a little bit later. But um, you've got a really cool family history in baseball yeah. as well. And uh, Tom Archdeacon from the Dayton Daily News wrote a great article about it. If you haven't checked that out, it uh, I think ran in uh, you know kind of late April this year. But yeah, right um, your grandpa played in the Negro Leagues as well as playing uh, a little bit of Major League Baseball back in the 40s and 50s. Yep. So you get here last year. Your first time in Dayton was uh, actually at the tail end of the 2021 season. And you get a fan that comes up to you after the game. So tell us a little bit about that story because that was a pretty unique uh, experience for you, it sounds like. Yeah, after the game, um, like I heard someone scream my name. So thought I was just going to sign an autograph or something and um, I walk up to him and he just hands me this massive book with like a hundred pages on like my grandpa's history and he just said like he was at the game a few days before um, like heard about like like saw me um, and like recognized the name from somewhere so went back home uh, looked it up and remembered um, James Proctor, who's, that's also my grandpa's name, um, and recognized him from the Negro Leagues. He said he was like a Negro Leagues historian. And um, he put together like like everything from my grandpa's baseball playing history, came back to the field and just handed it to me. Like I shared it with my grandpa and like it was, some of the stuff he hadn't seen in 30, 40 years. That's such a cool gift, right? Yeah, yeah it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> He still has it. So your grandpa played, uh, he played in the Negro Leagues, which at that time obviously was still very much Jim Crow era oh, segregation. Yeah. So some of the stories he must have told you were probably just incredible for you as a someone yeah. living in, in, you know, in the 2000s to think about, right? Yeah, I have a lot of appreciation for what he went through. Um, like he's told me endless stories, like endless like counts of racism playing throughout the South, like even in the North. Like he, he played all over the country. I've heard like stories from like the West Coast all the way to like Birmingham, Alabama. And um, a lot of it, a lot of it I don't have to deal with today. And I'm appreciative of that. And um, it's really impressive that he was able to go through that and like make it to the major leagues. So you're officially not allowed to like whine about a seven or eight hour bus trip in front of him, right? No, not at all. Not Not with what he went through. (laughs) So how much influence did he have on you pursuing baseball in general? Like obviously you grew up around him and, you know, his whole history. I'm sure that had something to do with it. But how much did that, I guess, kind of lead to the path that you ended up going down? Um, A lot of it. Like I started like as soon as I could, like growing up, I started pitching. And a lot of that was because of him. Like, I played other sports. Like, I was always best as a pitcher. Um, but he always, like, provided me with that extra motivation growing up, for sure, um, to pursue pitching. And we've, we've talked about it, like, every week, every day for the last 10, 15 years. Like, just him, like, telling me all he knows and just learning from each other. So at what point along that path, then, did you realize, like, hey, this is a lot more than just fun this is more than me just playing with like kids my age and stuff like I really have a chance to make this a career and go far like my grandpa did like at what point did you realize that you had the talent and the the gift to keep going with it um I would say probably sophomore year of high school okay um is when I first it was rocky road from there but that's when I first realized I had a chance okay was there like a moment you can remember or something like was it just was it velocity? Was it? Yeah, it, it was. Yeah. I, I think with most pitchers growing up, it's when you get that velocity bump. Yeah. Like I got that my sophomore year of high school. You just like look at your hand and it's like on fire. You're like, ah. Oh, like <laughs> yeah, <did>. like, <laughs> ra- like randomly gained five miles per hour in like a, a showcase or something. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So what, uh, obviously velocity is a, is a big thing as you're growing up and you're kind of going down this pitching path too, but how hard was it for you or did it come really easy for you to develop those secondary pitches in, in your entire repertoire? Um, that, that's like a never ending journey. Like I'm still working on that. Like every, like even today, every week. Um, but that's also a lot with like the entrance of like new technology. But, um, like back then I didn't have any secondary pitches. Really? It was yeah, just, I mean, I had blown them. it by people. Yeah. Yeah. But like, 
I mean, in high school, like you can just spin something and people freak out. Yeah. So <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be good. Then you get to a point where like it doesn't cut it anymore and you're like, exactly. okay, I have to beef this up a little bit. Exactly. So yeah. today, what pitches are you still working on or, or personally, like what is something that you want to maybe this year or, you know, in the near future get better at and something that you're consciously saying, hey, I want to improve this pitch? Um, so my, I would call my slider my best pitch, but I'm constantly trying to improve it because like with the technology we have now, like you can always be improving pitches like you really can um curveball room for improvement and then i've been throwing a change up for like two months that is almost my best pitch already nice so um i'm happy to like i'm excited to see where that goes so the the technology you referred to it a couple of times there yeah. what sort of things are you guys using now that really are the tools that you're you're getting the most out of you think um so i would say track man is the main one um, in college, I had no access to that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Um, so basically every throw off a mound I have like is tracked so, like with the ball movement and all of that. And I never had access to that. So just looking at that from start to start, um, working on what we can prove on in bullpens in between the starts has really been a game changer when I got to pro ball. So from that, it, it's, I'm assuming the way you're explaining it is you're trying to kind of figure out some of the finer points of like, where do I release or where's my arm angle, things like that, and just making some of those minor adjustments? Yes. We also have this thing called an edgertronic camera, uh -huh. and it's basically like a slow-mo of like your hand at ball release. Okay. And you can kind of see like, um, like what you're doing with your wrists, your fingers, like where the ball is coming off and can make like slight adjustments from there. Yeah. Are, Are you, you doing that like in a session or you, you'll throw a session you'll go in and watch video and then kind of come back out in the next session try to work on some of those things that's more of watch a video come okay. out and work on things in the next session it was just like to make sure things are consistent too like it's a lot of maintenance but also mm -hmm. like trying to get better too so where's and as someone who i mean we can kind of compare it like with golf right like yeah. Sometimes when you're working on something, you're just a complete train wreck. Or yeah. in, in, in my case, you're a train wreck most of the time. But where's, where's the line between working and tweaking and then just going out there and doing it with muscle memory? When do you have to kind of – I'm assuming you can't think about it that much during a game, right? Yeah, you can't. So that's why like, I try to put a lot of emphasis on my bullpens in between um, starts because that's, that's when you need to work on stuff. Mm -hmm. um, is I mean like if you're you have to be getting better at all times with how competitive it is mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of your development time like 20 pitches literally in between starts that that, that, that little of a period of time that you'll have yeah. right yeah but that's that's everything I think yeah because when you're out there in the game like obviously you're not thinking about like how much is this like pitch breaking or like how can I tweak this to break it more that's all bullpen stuff right so in a game then, when you, you lock some of those things out, what are, what are you focusing on in a game then? Um, just trying to get the hitter out. That's all. Like scouting reports, um, sequences, like how we attacked a guy the last set bat, um, what he might be expecting to see and how we can get around that, um, all sorts of stuff. How much do you keep in your brain during it? Just the way you're describing it. That <laughs> right. seems like a lot, right? I mean, yeah. so you got nine batters yeah. plus, you know, really, you know, guys that'll come in for pinch hitters or stuff like that. Like, how how are you keeping that kind of stuff straight during a game? I mean, obviously you so, went to Princeton, so you probably have a slightly more advanced mind than me. Than but we I, do, yeah. That seems like an awful lot to try to keep track of in a game. How do you do that? So in between innings, I go over the next like three to four hitters. Um, we have the charts like for how we pitched them last, okay. um, and also the scouting reports for like like where their um, weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. um, strengths like how to stay away from that stuff so it's really just keeping a memory bank of like three to four hitters <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and hope that the inning doesn't go past those four four guys right yeah it also um with the six game series we have and i'm pitching on sundays i have like five days to scout all oh, the hitters. Okay. yeah so at that point it's kind of ingrained in my mind I think that's an advantage. So the guy that has to pitch on Tuesdays on the first day. Right, he's the guinea pig, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I get to see five full night inning games like to, to get my game plan. So that's an advantage. So obviously we've talked a little bit. Your college experience, I think, is one of those that sticks out when you're looking at, you know, your report and your history that there's certain colleges just when you look at it on a piece of paper, it it is not the same as like I went to Bowling Green State University. Very different than Princeton. Like <laughs> last year, we had uh, Jacob Herdebees who went to West yeah. Point. Like same thing, there's certain things that jump off the page. We're like, all right, that's a little different. 
we were talking before. When I think of Princeton, I think of, again, me, like, dumb redneck kid thinks of, like, <laughs> pinkies out, Ivy, like, future lawyers, great Gatsby looking stuff all over the place. Like, yeah. How much of that is true and how much of that is like, no, dude, it's just like a, another college, just a, maybe a little bit harder to get into. And I am I am not allowed there. <laughs> so not going to lie. Some of that is true. <laughs> <laughs> so but, you weren't totally, totally right. Wrong, but okay. those are not the circles I was in. Like I was mainly like sticking like to the athlete side. But like a lot of that is true. Like there's things called eating clubs there, which or their version to like what? fraternity <laughs> so clubs? yeah it's very those were called all you can eat buffets yeah, where i was like, like mean girls were like you yeah. can't sit with us sorry sounds <laughs> like very formal but like yeah what? that's that's like how that's their version of like a fraternity or sorority yeah. okay yeah um so that's kind of that like proper like stigma you yeah everybody's got like uh plaid shirts on and walking around and not like, necessarily but like the fact they call them eating clubs like it's so funny <laughs> But then, uh, obviously, I'm sure there's parts of it that are, I mean, you walk to certain parts or, like, in the, the athletic circles and stuff where it's, like, it's not probably not that much different yeah, than going to somewhere same. else. Obviously, you're, were your teammates a little smarter than probably I mean, most, yeah, of course, most yeah. rosters? Yeah. <laughs> Naturally, yeah. <laughs> so then, that's the thing that's interesting, too, when you get to somewhere like here where you have so much data mm -hmm. all the time that you're going through. Like, was that something that you got used to at Princeton? Like, were you guys pretty data heavy or was it something um, that switched completely when you get to major league stuff we actually weren't data heavy at all so okay that's something that switched completely okay like as soon as i got here interesting yeah. is there a point where you just have too much data um i haven't gotten there yet but i'm sure there is yeah um as long as you can separate the game from like the data you're looking out at outside of the game i think it's fine because that's the only thing that, that blows my mind is like now you have probably 30 times more data and reports on people than people even had five ten years ago oh yeah it's like, so much yeah, more it's, and it's getting better every year yeah it's just you wonder where it stops at this point yeah i, I have no <laughs> idea <laughs> um the other thing i read too was that while you were at princeton you guys had zoom calls with folks that were like not just old mlb players but like legends like yeah. you had i think like i read like joe tory the boons joe madden like yeah, what were those zoom Harold calls Reynolds like too um a lot of yeah those came uh, when COVID canceled the season and like our coach, like we were just all back home. So our coach just Scott Bradley, um, who played in the bigs for like 10, 12 years, um, just had some of his old friends on like, and just talk with us for like an hour each. So is it, is it COVID. one of those things that it's just like, it's cool. Or do you actually take away things that you can apply on the field to those? Um, it was more just cool, like yeah. Yeah, hearing from them. Honestly, um, well, I'm sure they have some anecdotes and stuff that obviously help and yeah, kind of they, put your right mindset. And yeah, there was some there was some stuff they said that helped for sure. Who was your favorite that you guys had on? Um, so we had Aaron and Brett Boone on at the same time, cool. and because Jake Boone, um, Brett Boone's son, like I played with him, so okay. that's how they got on. Um, and that one was more funny, just like them just jabbing at each other the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were just. Basic at the end, they're basically yelling at each other, <laughs> <laughs> just making fun of each other. You, know, you get to listen to the uh, family rivalry going on there, pretty right. much. <laughs> yeah. Just arguing like different baseball philosophies. Like yeah. Aaron, like manager with the Yankees, is very analytic driven, and Brett was just more just play. You know, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Side note: Brett Boone, my wife's favorite baseball player ever. So she's like, she's always telling me how like when she was growing up, she's like, we went to go see him at a mall. And he was beautiful. And I was like, all right. That's Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I'm no Brett Boone. <laughs> right. Sorry. I just work in the front office. Ugh. So 2020, obviously, was a, just a nut year for everybody oh, yeah. with COVID. But that's the year you get done with college mm -hmm. and you get signed as a free agent. Yeah. So you're one of the guys now on our starting roster or starting, starting you know, pitching rotation that wasn't necessarily a high draft pick, that wasn't yeah, somebody that came over in a trade. What does that do for you? Does that fuel you? Does that, does, you know, is that something where you have to try to get over like a hump like that when you're surrounded by guys that maybe other people thought earlier on had more of a shot? Uh -huh. Like how does that, how does something like that play into what your mentality is on the field? Um, so I always knew I had the talent. It just didn't necessarily come together in college for a mm -hmm. lot of reasons. Like. One, like balancing the academics of Princeton with baseball. That's tough, first of all. Um, also, there were, <laughs> I, can imagine. There I can't some, imagine, but I could have. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> there were some injuries I dealt with as well. 
um, while there that kind of held me back. Yeah. I played through a lot of them, but you I would say they hindered performance pretty significantly. Um, but yeah, that definitely fuels me. Um, coming in, coming out of COVID, I work with, um, he's not with the Reds anymore, but he was with the Reds last year down in Daytona, mm -hmm. Forrest Herman, me and him in St. Louis. We're working together five, six days a week during COVID. And at that point, like that's when I started to get more data than I ever had before. And like basically went into like a year long, like um, cycle of just improving my pitches. And that was time I never had before to do that sort of stuff. And um, I think that really helps going into spring training of 2021. So it was almost a, in your case, it was almost a blessing, right? You had that, you had the time to step away and, and almost do like an apprenticeship, huh? Yeah, pretty much. It was incredible. Like, honestly, like that's exactly what I needed. Just that time to like devote to my crafts, like mm -hmm. get away from the like playing side of it for a little bit yeah. um, and just practice basically. It was a lot of practicing ugly, but it started to click <laughs> closer to spring training. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, at some point, right? Like you can practice and you can tinker, but you know, you have to, you have to go out and pitch every seven days. Yeah. So you're like, I can't tinker too much because I can't go out there and screw the team because I'm working on a pitch that's not even well, close. Well, this was like it. during 2020 when we didn't play. Right. So you, there was like so a year off, freedom. like, yeah, almost a year of just straight practice basically. Right. So you didn't have that. You didn't have to worry about like not letting things get too out of kilter because you had a game coming up and you couldn't let the team down. Exactly. So there were pitches we practiced for months, then like scratch, like <laughs> some that came easily. It's like, like James, that one's not going to work. Yeah. There was a lot of trial and error. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I came back with a completely different arsenal than I had in college. Like so the, was that where your Reds connection came from them? Because I read that while, while you were in the signing period, I think, mm -hmm. um, I, I think it starts at like, it's early in the morning, right? It's like 8 a.m. or something when it yeah. starts, and you shut it down like an hour after oh, yeah. the, the signing had started because you got an offer from the Reds, and you said that's where you wanted to be. What was it about Cincinnati that said, like, all right, this is where I want to make my start and my it was, home? It was really what they were doing with their player development. At that point is when I was really buying into the analytics. Um, and then they had Kyle Bodie on board, yep. um, who I love. Um, I've been to Driveline a couple times up in Seattle and also their new facility in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also Forrest, like I've known Forrest, I've worked with Forrest since like I was a freshman in high school a little bit. Okay. Um, so just the combination of like what they were doing on the player development side made it pretty easy for me. Yeah. yeah. So coming back to this year, you guys have had a ton of success, which is awesome. Oh, right. Yeah. Best uh, team I've ever been on by far. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's insane. <laughs> that's great. So how you know how do you when, when you're pitching right like we were kind of talking before we we hopped on the air here it's like you're gonna have good days you're gonna have some not so good days yeah. like <laughs> as a pitcher when you you know you're, you're kind of put there as the the tip of the spear of this team that's just rocking and rolling like when you're out there and maybe the stuff isn't as good like what do you what starts going through your head or how do you how do you keep the ship from uh you know for the, the train from going off the tracks if you're having a not so good day um that's when you just have to like focus on like the task at hand and like what you can control um like as a pitcher you're not you're gonna feel great probably three out of ten starts okay you're gonna feel like okay like four out of ten probably and then like not so good the other three out of ten and like i i think it's what you do like in those days you're not feeling good is that what really makes you mm -hmm. um yeah, like I had a start last week where I gave up seven runs in the first inning on <laughs> one hard <laughs> one on days. one hard hit ball. <laughs> like I kid you not, it was just bad luck after bad luck. Yeah, it was crazy, and like I'm happy I came. It was actually one of my proudest starts because I came back and went three and two thirds scoreless after that. So, so you mentioned that sometimes you're just gonna feel it, right? There's gonna be days where you're like, oh, I've yeah. got it. At what point do you feel it? Do you feel it like when you wake up and you're like? I got this. Today's gonna be a good day. Is when you show up. Is it the first out? Like when do you? I know? would I would say after the first inning. Okay. Like if you collect a couple of strikeouts, like just get a little grin. You're like, all right, today's the day. Yeah, yeah I'm exactly. feeling good. <laughs> yeah. Until balls start falling all over. You're like, wait a second. I felt wait, good. Yeah. I felt really yeah. good <laughs> ten minutes ago. What happened? <laughs> I mean, that, you're, you're something, that'll happen, right? Like, yeah. You'll I mean, feel great. That's why it's just, it's, it just doesn't work. That's why it's also hard to like look at results from week to week mm -hmm. because, I, yeah, like I I try to be as much like much as much process based as possible um like not results based yeah like going back to the data like reviewing that from the outings um 
but you definitely do look at the results some too. <laughs> that's what that's what it has to be so hard to be a pitcher because you can do everything right. You can do all of the pregame work. You can know his weak spots. You can mm-hmm. do everything. You can put that pitch right where you want it. And some kid closes his eyes, gets lucky, oh, yeah. swings, and it goes into the dragon's lair. It's like, yeah. okay, I, I did everything I was supposed to, and that's going to reflect on my stat line. Exactly. And that's, that's it's the unknown, right? There's an element of luck in there. And I'm sure it goes the other way, too, where you miss your spot, and the dude just, just get gets out. buckled on a knee or something. You're like, all right, well, that worked out, too. But <laughs> it's still got to be frustrating because not everything's in your control. It's super frustrating. Trading. I'd like to think it even evens out though over the long run, over the course of a season. Yeah. So that's kind of what I fall back on. <laughs> Baseball gods will will level everything out at some point. Exactly. <laughs> You're gonna get your like scores two line drive with the bases loaded at one point, like, yeah. right to someone, and yeah. then like that's the sort of stuff that levels it out. Yeah, you strike out seven, and you're like, I got real lucky out there, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> So the the rotation this year is a little bit different than what you're probably ha- have been used to, right? We're doing a six man rotation because we have these six game home stands, so it just yeah. kind of makes more sense. So you tend to you've had a couple different dates with different spots on rotation, but you have like you're the day, right? And so right now you're the Sunday guy, yeah. So you you kind of know what's coming up. Compare that to what you've known in the past, like you know some of the pluses, some of the minuses of a of a routine like that that the average fan might might think are pretty interesting. I would say it's really only pluses, other than the fact that I always want to pitch. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I like, for instance, like today, like is this a recovery day? I know every Tuesday is a recovery day. Every Wednesday, I'll throw aside, like I'll lift, um, like continue with my recovery. Thursday is mapped out. Friday I'll get on the mound again. Saturday is really just more relaxed, getting ready for Sunday. But like every day of the week's exact same. Mm-hmm which is pretty nice and like keeps you pretty accountable for your routine. Yeah, there's not there's not much adjustment. It just is what it is. <laughs> but you said your mentality though, you just want to pitch all the time. Yeah, like I would if I had it my way, I would pitch more, mm-hmm. but <laughs> it in terms of routine, um it's probably for the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean we've had some other pitchers on and so they like it, the hardest thing is like you just want to go pitch all the time but you can't do that, right? Yeah. yeah. That is do hard. So as far as, I guess, you're prepping your mentality pregame before you go out and you're going to take them out, do you have anything that you do that gets you ready for that game? Like, is there certain playlists? Is there certain time frames that you're doing things like to get ready on a Sunday? Um, so home games on Sunday are at 1. Um, typically, I'll wake up at 9, just grab some breakfast, um, head to the field around 11. And to that point, I'm just listening to music. Um, like getting ready for uh, the game at one. Um, I try not to lock in until like an hour or so before the game, like because then I'll just psych myself out. Like I tried, I try to say like pretty even keeled until then. What music are you listening to? Um, a lot of Polo G. I don't know. If okay. You, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Polo so, G. Well, so I mean. I always wonder that. One of us knows what that is. You see, yeah. (laughs) I'm a little younger than Brad. (laughs) But it's like, you see these guys, you know, and you're you're at your locker, you're, nobody's bugging you, you're getting ready, you just wonder, you're like, does he have, yeah. you know, what's he got in there, right? Is it just Jock Jams Volume 3? Is it, is it (laughs) Princeton Swing Jazz? Like, what is it that's in there, right? I have no idea. It's like, all right, so you're getting pumped up. Yeah, I'm getting pumped up. That's good. (laughs) So, but as a starting pitcher, you've got your one day where you're like hyper locked in, right? But yeah, then you've yeah. got all of the other days to like kind of not have to be locked in. So give us some insight. What's it What's it like down there, you know, in the clubhouse, in the dugout when you're not locked in and you can just like hang out with the guys? Um, so we play a lot of ping pong, um, a lot of cards, ton of cards. Mm-hmm. Um, there is, there's obviously a lot of free time. Like yeah. we get here at like 1.32, game's not till 7. So my work like on a typical day probably takes like two to three hours to get in. And outside of that, I have a couple hours just to relax out of the clubhouse with the guys. Um, yeah, a lot of different card games. Um, what's, your, what's your favorite? Um, this game called Chinese Poker. Okay. Um, I don't know if you heard of it. I think, well, I, I, I think some of our other guys have told us a little bit about it. Yeah, between but that yeah. and AC Doocy, they say they AC play a Ducey lot. Yeah. Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you a ping pong guy, or you just watch um, it? I kind of. I'd like to say I'm decent. Um, yeah. Who's the ping pong ringer down there? I heard Stockton was really good before. Evan Kravitz is my kryptonite. Is he? Yeah. Really? 
Like, he doesn't hit it hard, but, like, he literally cannot get the ball by him. <laughs> he's just sitting there in the middle of the table, just, like... He can just go all day <laughs> long. Bored. Yeah, just he's all like, all right. right. Yeah. Yeah, it just frustrates me. <laughs> you're like, yeah, you're just like, I don't even care if this like is in or out. I'm just gonna hit it as hard as I can at yeah. you, just to, hit, <laughs> just to physically hit you with this ping pong ball that will do nothing, but it'll make me feel better. No, it's still gonna hit his paddle. He's gonna, return it. <laughs> he's gonna crush I'm it. Right you, back it's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you had to, if baseball didn't pan out, but you had to play a secondary sport, what was your mm-hmm. second best sport growing up? I would say basketball, probably. Okay. Um, that's what a lot of people in my family play as well. Okay. Um, but baseball is by far the best at. Really? So there was never a question. There was there was there was no <laughs> yeah. moment where you had to make this like fork in the road decision. You're like, no, it's it's baseball all the way. Yeah, yeah. ten times better at baseball <laughs> the whole time. Like I do that since like I was like 15, 14. Yeah. Well, yeah. the fact that you're like well over six feet probably helps with the basketball thing. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, but then for the position I was playing, I'm really not that tall. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, I was like a power forward. Yeah. I'm 6'5". Like, that's that works in high school. Must be nice. Past that, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it sounds crazy, but it's true. I'm only 6'5". It's not five, an issue uh, Andrew has to deal with. Yeah, no, no. I'm just trying to ride all the rides at Kings Island. That's all I'm trying to do. <laughs> someday. Someday you'll get there, buddy. What? Oh, yeah. uh, so, outside of baseball, right? Everyone kind of likes to know, like, what do you guys do? What, what do you do when you're not playing? And I, I realize this time of year, there's probably very few days where you're not. But, like, yeah. what, what kind of things do you like to do when you're not at the ballpark? Um... Trying new restaurants, um, a lot of video games, um, getting out to the golf course when we can. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just really not anything specific on a given day, but just um, try to decompress. Uh, after games, there's not much time, so that's just mainly going back to the apartment, yeah. hanging out for an hour or so, and going to bed and doing it the next day. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I so, mean, do you have to be a golfer to uh, to be a pitcher as well? Is that like is that a given? I, so, I know I don't, I'm not sure I've ever met a pitcher who isn't yeah. also a golfer. So I'm like the worst golfer ever. But like I try. <laughs> or a golfer? Uh, <laughs> yes. No, I would not call myself a golfer. Courses, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ask anyone, and they'll, they'll probably say I'm the worst golfer ever. You get your money's worth, right? Like yeah. all those other guys, they pay the money, and then they only get like seventy or eighty strokes. You're yeah, getting what, like a hundred? Oh yeah, I get it. definitely get way way more than a hundred. I don't I don't think I've ever completely finished a round, honestly, with a full score. <laughs> yeah, at some point you, just, you start giving up. You start the unhappy face. Yeah, you get to see more of the course than they do. They they just stick right down. Oh the yeah, I'm in the, the woods. Yeah, you like, get to yeah, it's nature there. All yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See the ball in the water. The wildlife. Yeah. yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's, fun to get out. it's fun to get out though, though, right? Yeah, it definitely is. What about so you were in Dayton for a little while last year? Now, obviously, you've been back for for this year as mm-hmm. well. So, what uh, what have you done? Gotten out? I mean, you know, say so you like to go to restaurants. Any place yeah. in town that uh, has become a new favorite, aside from the fast food places and stuff like that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Really just sticking to the normals, like Chipotle. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's yeah. all right. Yeah. You're, you're, not, you're not going out for like swanky steak dinners or anything just yet? Um, no. We did on the road one day. We kind of splurged at this one steakhouse. That was pretty good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for the most part, just keeping it to the basics. <laughs> That's all right. Well, I mean, yeah, you do have other things to do, right? So you don't exactly have a ton of time to go do all that. When everybody else goes out to dinner, you guys are here playing baseball, right? Pretty much. I'm sure. I'm sure Leah, our nutritionist, and everything will appreciate you not saying that. You're like, oh yeah, my favorite is like three whoppers at you know <laughs> whatever. Actually, yeah. guys, some of these guys are pretty big. They could probably do that. Yeah. yeah. The one thing I will say is when some of the big league rehab guys were here, they got us some nice meals. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like Vado got us like some steaks. Nice. Um, a lot of other stuff too. Like Castillo, same thing. Nobody's going yeah. home hungry on those nights. No, those are the best nights. You're like, you guys can come back whenever you want, right? You know that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are looking at, you're looking at the DL like, all right, who's coming back yeah, yeah, here in the yeah. next all week right. or so? Yep. They're probably is going to come through Dayton. <laughs> going to eat yeah. good on Wednesday. Going to eat good on Friday. Yeah. Yeah. So when they come, <laughs> you're definitely eating good. <laughs> Congratulations on all the success. We hope that uh, we hope it continues for you, and we'll look forward to some great things for you from the rest of the uh, rest of the season. Thank you. It was great talking with you guys.